Hello. Uh, I'm uh, Jim McGuigan. I've been asked by Jerry Lawless and whoever else is involved in this um, little enterprise to say something about uh, how I got to where I am and specifically in relation to God who has shown himself I'm clicking this pen uh, shown himself uh, in and as the Lord Jesus Christ uh, truth is I don't know where to start this so let Let's see where it goes. Uh, I, I was born in Belfast, um, a little house called, a little house on a street called Cooper Street, 101 Cooper Street. Uh, I was the 12th child of 13 that my mother bore. Uh, nine of us made it to adulthood. The other four died early with diphtheria and such. Um, how did I become uh, a Christian? Well, some of the obvious things, I'll be saying very obvious things to you, things that are what everybody else experiences. But uh, I, I think this is true. Oh, 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 oh. Oh, and I need to say this. I find that when I'm looking back on my life, and I think this is true of people in general, when they look back on their life, they interpret their earlier life in the light of their present sense of things. You, you know what I mean, of course. I mean, I knew when Ethel and I married back in 1956, uh, we knew what we were doing, and yet we didn't know what we were doing. Because when, for example, two people get married, they close doors to things they might have done um, otherwise. Uh, they make decisions now in the light of being married, Decisions that change the direction that they go in their life, yes? Um, and you don't know where those decisions are going to lead. So life becomes altogether different. I didn't know, nor did Ethel know, that when we married one another, there would be people that we would never finally hang around. Good people or some not so good people. But we didn't know how our decision in life was going to affect where we would be, what we would do, what jobs we would take if we had jobs to take, and the like. So that a decision way back earlier in your life, without you knowing it, that decision changes paths roads, forks that you will or will not take. So while I'm telling you what happened to me, and some of it is very obvious, um, I didn't know then that I was going to be where I am today. So it all make uh, sense to you? Anyway, um, I, I remember, I think this is true, I'm, I'm attempting not to embellish anything, I'm, I'm trying to be factual about it. But I also have to say, when I'm trying to be factual, that what I did then led to other things that I didn't know then. I was going to end up doing. Anyway, my, my mother uh, was very religious. Uh, my sister Margaret 
and this is in the early years. My sister Margaret, I think, was born to be good, that kind of a, a girl. And she was very religious also. And my mother and Margaret must have had, I'm sure this is true, must have had a serious effect on how I and, and others, but certainly me, speaking of me, must have had a serious effect on me. For as long as I have a, a memory, I mean a clear memory of myself, I was always very religious. God was always in my thoughts when uh, I was a boy. The truth is, and I, I'm jumping back and forward here, but I don't know what I'm doing. I used to run to the, with a, a, a crowd of young fellas to the YM. Started, I don't know, maybe around 14 years of age. And I, this is true, I remember telling those guys I was going to be a preacher. That's true. I don't know why I would have said that. We were all talking about, I presume, what we were going to do and where we were going to be and what we thought was ahead and all of that. But at some point and in some way, I expressly remember me saying uh, I was going to be a preacher. I wasn't even in Christ at that point. But somehow I knew I was going to be a preacher. Anyway, Margaret, my sister Margaret, and my mother uh, had a great effect uh, on me because early boyhood, I don't know what I'm saying, I'm just throwing out a number here, eight or nine years of age, I already was very God conscious. But, and this I know, I was very much afraid of him. Some years later, maybe when I was 12 or 13, something like that. I'm guessing those ages. I used to dream, fear-filled dreams. You know, one that really sticks with me, I don't think of it much now, but years ago, I used to think of it regularly, I dreamed that I was on a big uh, plate of glass on it. And I was rising to go to heaven. And I was all nervous about it. And then, truth, hand on my heart before God, the, it started to tilt. And I started to slide as if I was going to slide off it. So I reached for the top end of it and held on to it. And it was you know, slanted, uh, but holding on kept me on it. And then the glass edge was sharp and began to hurt and cut my fingers. I don't know how the dream ended. Maybe I wakened up at that time, but I read that. I uh, dreamed that a time or two. And then other dreams like that, not as uh, vivid as that. But I was always afraid uh, that God sort of, not had it in for me, but, you know, he was a holy God after all. And I went a time or two to a little Pentecostal church, little gospel halls with my mother and my sister. And um, then I went to Sunday school uh, at a Methodist uh, place. I remember the face of a fellow who used to teach class regularly, but I, uh, I don't remember his name. I just know that he too must have been affecting me. And then because we were very poor, uh, this uh, mission church would send us down to a place called Child Haven a couple of times a year. And down there, we always went to church and we always prayed together. All of this was done. All of this affecting me. I know that must have been the case. But by the time I was in my early teens, I knew, uh, well, I said I knew, uh, I knew I was going to be a 
preacher. And why I knew I was going to be a preacher, I have no idea. But it's what I told Harry Bell. There's a name I, I remember, one of the boys. I would tell Harry, and we'd be around there, and I told him I was going to be a preacher. You believe that? Now, I know that people have freedom to choose. And I know they make choices that lead to other choices that seem inevitable. I know we do that. I believe in free will. I get that. But I believe that God, who is the Lord of all, uh, you can't trust him. He sneaks up on you. And he's always working at you before you ever get to know. He's working at you. He puts you in, and I don't know the uh, complexities of it all when I say he puts you in with the right people. I don't know how that works, but I do know that I had a mother and a sister who must have had an effect on me, for I did go to church with them. And I did hear Margaret singing. And my mother, uh, I'd hear her sing every now and again. Uh, Rescue the Perishing, I think, was her favorite hymn. So all the while, here's my view of it now, all the while God was talking to me through my mother and my sister, hearing them singing, not setting me down and singing to me, though that wasn't unusual. But uh, Margaret would teach me uh, some little courses. Uh, and I, I, could, I used to be able to sing them all. And, all of, and because I liked singing, our whole family liked singing. My mother sang. My sister Margaret sang. My sister Agnes had a terrific voice. And my sister Annie, she was a blues singer. Everybody sang. I even heard my father once or twice singing. Amazing. My brother Willie was always singing. My brother George, who I would have bet money, wouldn't sing. I'd hear him sing once in a while. How did that all happen? So, and my brother Eddie, he, he's big on singing. My sister Kathleen, she did a bit of her singing also. Everybody enjoyed singing. And so because I enjoyed singing and because of the early years when the songs were pretty much church songs, little gospel meeting, uh, hall uh, hymns and choruses and that, all of that was affecting me. For to this day, if I could remember the first line of a little chorus, I could sing it all the way through. So it must have got down in there and in this way God was working on me and shaping me to get ready to save me from myself, for myself, and not just for me, but for other people as well. You believe that, don't you? You believe that of everyone who is called into our Lord Jesus Christ by the gospel. Well, I was keen. Uh, I, I had a really bad mind. All of us as kids really had a bad mind. We would curse real bad. And we did other things, break into people's houses, stuff like that. Um, and more, worse, and I'm not going to tell you about it. But in any case, all of that was going on, and at the same time, all what I'm now telling you was going on. Some forces and evil powers and influences and people who were not good for me or for themselves, and I'm, I'm not critiquing them for it, because they were in the same world I was in. They weren't doing me any good. They were calling me in another direction, but God knew all of that and was calling me in a good direction. Well, my first personal, serious, conscious religious commitment to God was when I was a member of the Pentecostal Church 
I was in it for, I don't know, a little less than two years, up to my throat in it. Thoroughly enjoyed it, enjoyed the singing, the noise, the vibrancy of it, the aliveness of it. But this was after I'd made the commitment, you see. I went to, in Belfast, I went to the Ulster Hall, and they had an American preacher over preaching. He was a gentleman who said he was healing people all over the place. I don't mean to be rude. It was not. It was not good. But the gospel uh, was being told. God was made to be center. Jesus was made to be his son and Lord. The Holy Spirit was uh, mentioned and at work. All of that. And, and a call to upright living. All of that was going on. So whatever the flaws in what was going on there, good things were going on as well. And I remember uh, that night when I told God right where I was sitting, there must have, I don't know, 1,800, 2,000 people in that Ulster Hall. Uh, and I told God I wanted to be a Christian. I left that hall, walked round to the city center, just outside the city hall, dead center of Belfast. And people gathered around there on the weekends. And I walked out in the middle of those people. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, uh, I'm feeling a little embarrassed about it. I don't know why. <laughs> but I walked out in the middle of those people, and I just started talking about Jesus Christ. Isn't that, isn't that interesting? And uh, I don't know how long I talk for, but I talk for a long time. I normally do, except now when I'm told 35 minutes. But that's okay as well. But I was talking and talking. When it was all over... A woman came to me and she says to me, you are a prophet. She thought I spoke well and thought I was a prophet. I didn't think I was a prophet. But uh, I know I said prophetic things from the biblical witness. And where it all came from, it had to all come from God through my mother, my sister, Sunday school teachers when I went, we all went to Sunday school until we were 14. And then at 14, we all quit going to Sunday school. Well, not all of us, but the bulk of us. But in that time period, God was feeding me, helping me, making me think of better things, engaging in bad things, but feeling guilty about it regretting that I was involved, all of that. But I was, a, I was a happy little pagan, you see. I mean, there were a lot of harmless things we were doing. I mean, it was just a great life. We were poor as a church mice, but you didn't have to have money to have a great time. And all the kids I knew and all the kids I grew up with, we were all poor, but we were happy little pagans. But all the while, we were happy little pagans, and the harmless things that we were engaging in, these are God-given. They did us good. The games we played in the street helped to offset things that were going on in the home that few people wanted to talk about, and certainly the victims of it didn't want to talk about. But all the while, in the middle of all of that, the sovereign God who has come to us in and as Jesus Christ, who wants to save us in all the senses that salvation works. Save us so that we can dream great dreams, enjoy harmless and lovely joys, enter into lovely human relationships. Think of grand projects that help other people without being too sugary and too sweet, yet but wanting to be decent and upright and fine. Hanging around good company that helped strengthen your own weaknesses. You know, but offset those and make you stronger, make you, make you able to say no to things that you should say no to and yes to things that you should say. All of that is going on in and during the time when we were 
doing what we wanted. So I went to this place, heard all of this, decided that very evening, I'm in, count me in. I left the big building, went into the city hall, and began to preach. Just, that was it. And then I attached myself to the Pentecostal church, and uh, a couple of years there, had a great time. We would go around street, uh, street preaching all over the place. We'd have microphones and blasting people out in their little houses and that. But it was it, it, we were we were doing what we thought was right and uh, enjoy that. Then I had a great time. I had a great time. I loved it and was learning and was getting a sense that while truth is truth and information must be true about God, and I still believe that with a deep and abiding conviction. If it's not true, it's not any good. But beyond the correctness of theological and, and biblical and textual truths, I had a sense that God wanted into our lives at the emotional level also, and that has never left me. And I'm, I'm wired uh, that way, you understand. So, then my sister Agnes, who was very religious also, she met up with a, fellow, a young fellow called Hugh Tinsley. They liked one another. By and by, a fellow called, his name's gone, uh, an American evangelist, went over into Belfast, preached the gospel to a very religious young man called Hugh Tinsley, he ended up teaching him things in addition uh, about the Lord Jesus Christ and what the Lord Jesus Christ called us to do if we wanted to commit to him and be part of him. And Hugh Tinsley was baptized into Christ. Then Hugh met up with my sister Agnes. They loved one another by and by. Hugh Tinsley uh, went to America, the gentleman whose name I can at this moment remember, which may come to me as I speak. Uh, he worked to get Hugh to come over to America to, to go to college. And uh, he certainly went, uh, what at that point was Florida Christian uh, College with Homer Haley and other people like that. And then Agnes, he invited Agnes out uh, to marry him. She went out, married him, and they spent some uh, years there. Then Hugh and Agnes came back home to work in Northern Ireland. And because he was now my brother-in-law, um, he and I got to talking. I admired him greatly. I liked how he looked and how he carried himself. I didn't know that later on he was as insecure as I was, but I couldn't tell it because he, he handled the scriptures so well and all of that. And he began to talk to me about some truths about Jesus Christ and how one responds to him. Uh, and one point in particular, as you would expect, uh, if, if you remember the Church of Christ, you would expect this. Uh, he mentioned the baptism issue. And though I didn't know all, and nor did he at that point, apparently, uh, we knew it was something that invariably in the New Testament uh, people um, did in a faith response to our Lord Jesus Christ. And we entered into union with him that way. But I didn't know that at the time, didn't believe that at the time, didn't know to believe it at the time. So I went to a, a number of preachers in the Pentecostal group that uh, I was connected with and asked them about these matters. And without getting into all the details, it was, it was pretty clear pretty clear. It was pretty clear that they didn't, a couple of them just didn't want to know. I, I'm, I'm speaking the truth, yeah, because I had a couple just walk away and that was not. Others just had never seen these scriptures 
uh, and I said, you know, Acts 22, 16, rise and be baptized, Paul, rise and be baptized and uh, have your sins washed away, calling on the, name, on the name of the Lord. He said, that's not in the Bible. <coughs> and I showed him the text and he, he just didn't know what to say. Well, I went on and on about that for a, a while. And I talked to a number of people there and no one wanted to bother. Well, it began to bother me that I had not done this. And it began to bother me that there were scriptures in there that I I didn't want to read and didn't want to deal with, though the New Testament has them all over the place, you see. And finally, I could uh, no longer put it off. So I went to Hugh and said, I, I don't know what else to do about this. I enjoy where I am and all of that kind of thing, but I need to... I need to express my faith in the, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ and become part of the Christ by being baptized into him. You know, all the scriptures are there. Ask someone beside you. They'll tell you where they are. So I was baptized into Christ. And uh, so he, he was the one uh, who... Uh, I'd never. I, I'd read some books in school. You know how you do that in school book. But I'd I'd never read books. Uh, I'd never been much of a student. I, I wasn't silly or anything, and nothing wrong with my head. I just was a happy little pagan, and we did all kinds of things. You know, soccer playing and whatever, whatever it was. We were doing all of that. But he was the fellow who got me to read, and he gave me books to read, and I. Um, I took to it like a duck to water. Who would you hold responsible for that? I knew it wasn't the devil who was getting me to read good books. I knew it wasn't the devil who was getting me to read stuff about the Lord Jesus Christ and point me to scriptures and, and having me in them. I knew that God was using Hugh Tinsley and my sister Agnes, in whose home several of us would get together and, and study and pray together. I knew this was the work of God because at least mentally, I, I've never been a very good man, I, and I'm not a very good man now. I just know that I'm a believer, and, and that I know. Come what may with me. You may hear all kinds of me doing bad things or disappointing you and all the rest of it, but what you won't hear ever is that I have lost my trust in God and Christ. I'll never leave. The only way I would leave is if he would throw me out. And he says, he that comes to me, and there's a, there's a present tense there, and it might well mean he who continues to come to me. That's certainly one of the possibilities, grammatically. But he said, he that comes to me, I'll never throw him out. And he says, don't be afraid. I will never leave you, nor will I ever forsake you. And to one uh, uh, and to his people, he would say, no, I have worked it out, he says, where no weapon shaped against you will hurt you. So I'm safe in Christ, and that's where I'm staying. So um, I became richer in the gospel. My heart and mind became richer and so whatever I didn't execute or couldn't get done right, whatever I blundered around in, I knew what I knew. And I committed to God that which I committed to him, he said, I'll take care of it. And I committed myself to him as I was. You know, whatever that means. And I don't know who I am in the end. Paul will say in 1 Corinthians 4, I know nothing against myself. I don't care what you think of me, he says to the Corinthians. I know nothing against myself. Yet, in this, I'm not justified. For it is God that justifies. God knows me. Whatever I am, I am. But I know this, I've made a commitment to him. And I've made a commitment to his gospel. Day by day, 
I'm reading and listening to wise men and women who have spent years specializing in important areas about God and his self-revelation in Jesus Christ and the establishment of his church that is the New Testament elect that is to speak and bear witness to him for the world. Day by day, I'm learning things about him more exciting, more rich, more fulfilling, more able uh, to just rejoice in this thing. Now that, that, I don't know if it's true. I love our kids. Elton and I had three kids. And for them, you know what I mean. Die for them in a heartbeat, forfeit my life in Christ if it were needed for them? Yeah, I would. I would. Paul said that in Romans 9. Moses said that in Romans 32, Exodus 32, 32. Shelving that, I really get a buzz out of hanging around God and Christ. All I want to do now, I keep asking him for more help and he, he doesn't give me any more. All I want to do now is understand, be thrilled by it, and tell it. My subject, if I speak, my subject is always right, except maybe this one, but I was asked to do this. My subject is always right, but I always screw up the presentation. But in the middle of that, even a screwed up declaration of the story still has power in it. Where am I uh, today as a Christian? Well, if I'm allowed, I'm coming up on 80. I'll be 80 shortly. And uh, so, you know, Watch me, watch me killing over dead while I'm talking to you. I won't have uh, many more years to go here, but but it's 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 exciting the thought of moving over uh, to the other side, for the other side cannot, oh, cannot be worse than this. It's going to be better. Paul said that in Philippians 1. And if it's better than my life now, <laughs> if it's better than my life now, it's going to have to be wondrous. And it's, it's, it's that joy. It's, it's that vibrant, living hope. Did you say 30 a while ago? Okay. My daughter's the camera person. She watches me to keep me from rambling all over. She's a great girl. The joy that I experience uh, right now, uh, when, when I'm thinking about all of this and wanting to know more, is what I want to share with my daughter and the two boys and my close friends and the little congregation I'm with and then and then to anybody we can be in touch with anybody we can get to hear I scribble a good bit I think I've written 34 books there are a number of them I wouldn't write again. They're not very good. But I did what I could then, and I'm still doing what I can do. I don't sell, for pity's sake. And there are a lot of good reasons for that, I'm sure. All I'm telling you is, all I want to do these days is think about him. Get to really know him. Talk about him write about him. 
that it's what I want to do. I want to embody him, of course. I want to do what is right. I, I don't want to do bad things. I want to do good things. That's where I am currently. It's a great life. And it means not only now do we rejoice, and, and I need to butt in with that. Forget, forget that sentence for a minute. If our people, are you a preacher or a teacher? Look, aren't you rejoicing? You and I, people like us, we must so speak, centrally speak about him. If others are going to enter into the joy that he has given to us, how does he give you and me? I'm speaking now to preachers and teachers, men or women, would, in whatever way you function as those who teach and preach. How does he fill you with joy? How does he fill you with excitement? Why do you every now and again feel like getting up from where you are and just at least for a moment or two, shouting it? How does that happen to you? It's always when the truth of God comes to us and we know him better. That that leads you and me to rejoice is what will make them more joyful, more assured, happier about the future, looking at the present with all the hard, hard things, sometimes harsh things that come their way, and see them for what they are, hard and harsh, and yet see them with a new vision for the one that you and I are coming to know more and more. If, if we're spending our time studying, prayerfully asking for his help, going to people who help us get to know him, if we're doing that, we're becoming richer and more assured in our own hearts. God hadn't given this kind of joy and truth that brings joy and the word that Jesus says in John 6, 63, the words that I speak to you are spirit and life. He isn't giving these things to us just for us. And if you don't give it to the church, if I don't give it to the church, when we know we've got it, or that we could get it, huh? if we don't give it to them, God would call us, I think, God would call us dives, the Latin name of the rich guy in Luke 16 who fed sumptuously every day while Lazarus lay there starving, ulcerated, isolated, all of that. If you and I were to hold on to what it is that God is giving us or not going to get what we know how to get, and be filled with it and then offer it to our brothers and sisters. We're robbing them. A million Lazaruses are around us starving. And uh, we are what? Religious lecturing. Let's be done with that. Religious lecturing. Information about geographical where he went and he did that and who this and what the genealogies are and, and all of that. It's the last thing I want to say. This is where I am.
some of you who may well know me will think, boy, he talks a great case, doesn't he? I don't know. All I know is that there's a gospel. All I know, and this is where I am now. I, I've been asked, what, 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 how, how has your journey been? All I can tell you for sure is where I am now. I think this is true. I, what I'm about to say I think is true. I don't trust me. I don't. Somebody says, well, that's very humble of him. I'm not talking about humility. I'm talking about I don't trust me. The only one I trust is him. And then I see him act in my daughter, in my sons, in my friends, in people who teach me, people who speak to me. I trust him. And that's, that's, that's all I want to do. It's, it's essentially who I now am. A watch is, it's all cogs and spindles and batteries and little figures on a face, a little bracelet, uh, all of that. Uh, you can take the back of this Timex open and, and check it all out and you could describe it. And if you could do it well, you could describe it flawlessly. But if you happen to be able to do that, a very intelligent man or woman, way out somewhere away from civilization that have nothing to do with watches, give them that, and they could finally get it open. They could describe it. But if they don't know what it's for. They don't know what it is. And I'm saying, I'm saying a preacher or a teacher or a congregation as a teaching institution, if it doesn't know what the Bible is for, it can show you how it's linked together and tell you all, answer all the questions and all of that. If it doesn't know what the Bible is for, it really doesn't know what it is. A watch is not about cogs and levers and spindles and batteries and hands. It's about something bigger. It's about time, this cosmic reality. That's what it's about. And that? It's not about this person, that person, and the other. All of that is a part of the essential furniture. Without cogs and spindles and all of that, there is no watch. And if the watch was broken up and all the pieces were land scattered all over the place, there'd be no watch. But even when it's all there, even when you understand how it's all linked together, if you don't know what it's for, you don't know what it is. And people like me, who can tell you all how it fits the bits and pieces and, and how Noah fitted in with this, that, and the other, and how the genealogies work and all of that, if I don't know what it's for, if I only know that it's made up of genealogies and it's made up of trips and it's made up of events and it's made up of persons and it's made up of evil stories and good stories, if I know all that's in there but don't know why it's here, I, I don't know what it is. But if I know what it is, it's because someone has helped me come to know it's about it's about God self revealing himself it's about God saying to a world I love you so I don't want you away from me I want you to come home to me and I want you to have a life, life that is brimful of life. And 
And if we, the church of God, if we, the preachers and teachers, men and women, who do what we do to instruct the people of God, if we don't get that, if we don't see that, if we don't become persuaded that as as uh, 1, 1, uh, 7, 18, 1 18 of Colossians says, Christ has been raised the firstborn from the dead that in all things he might have the preeminence. If we don't know he ought to be the, have the preeminence in the lectern and the pulpit, we don't know what we're doing. That's who I am, and it's sort of how I got here. I don't know how I got here. You know I got here by God, and whatever in me is not like him is the stuff he continues to work with to transform it into his likeness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be merciful unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you shalom.